Yeah. Nicholas Cage. Motherfuckers better know. This motherfucker hold his heat right, baby. All these motherfuckers better know. When I started doing animation, the first thing I ever animated was, uh, I called it Office Space. It was, uh, Milton and what became Lumberg in the movie. Milton, when I did the animated one, was loosely based on my first engineering job. There was this guy, he's kind of an odd guy. As I recall, he had a mail order bride from, <laughs> I think, the Philippines, and he, no one ever talked to him. And one day I was just kind of bored. I went over and just said, you know, hey, how's it going? And he just launched into this thing about how he was going to quit because they moved his desk three times. I just did recorded a monologue of myself doing Milton, the thing about moving the desk, and I animated that, and that became my first short. Yeah, that would be terrific. Um, well... When Gary Cole came in and read, I, I just, that... That was a good day, because I, I, was, I was on the fence about making the movie. He came in and read, and I was just like, oh my god, if I can... If nothing else, if I get this guy on camera doing that character, that'll be worth it. I'm also gonna need you to go ahead and come in on Sunday, too, okay? I was really happy with the cast I got. My Lumberg was based on a, on a ripoff of the, of the cartoon, which basically was a ripoff of Mike Judge. So I went in and did my greatest, you know, attempt at, a, at a, an imitation of Mike Judge. You know, at that time, there was a lot of people doing films and stuff with an Indian character or a Middle Eastern character or a, a guy from there. And we talked a little bit about how it was important to make Samir really specific. You know, so we talked about Jordan. I would relax. I would sit on my ass all day. I would do nothing. I think Peter's trying to figure it all out. When I read the script, the thing that jumped out was, uh, here's a guy that's like, constantly searching for answers. I was asking what you were doing for lunch. Would you like to have lunch with me? Every time he finds one, he's sure that he's found, you know, the, the key to Nirvana, and he throws himself in it wholeheartedly. I just came to get my address book. I'm not gonna stay. I got a phone number mic that I don't wanna lose. What? And then when it doesn't work out, it, it doesn't deter him from, you know, throwing himself wholeheartedly into the next one, you know? Where all of a sudden, being a construction worker is gonna be, you know? <laughs> he is like, so pure, you know what I mean? And so awesome and such of a handsome real guy. You know, these completely sticking up for like the ugly guys and like completely <laughs> sticking up for his friends. So you're gonna fire Michael and Samir and you're gonna give me more money? And you wanna be like, yeah, man, lead me. You know, he's the president. I don't know about you guys, but I'm tired of being pushed around. Aren't you? Yes, Peter, but I'm not doing to do anything illegal. Illegal? Samir, this is America. Honestly, I kinda saw my job on this one as, uh, as kind of being a bus driver a little bit. You just drive to the next stop and open the door and somebody funny gets on and... I gotta get out of here. I think I'm gonna lose it. Uh-oh. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. <laughs> I sort of felt like Peter's job was to kind of get the audience from, from this scene to that scene. And then it was other people's jobs to come in and like make the scenes great. The 7-Eleven, right? Mm -hmm. You'd take a penny from the tray. From the crippled children? No, that's the jar. I'm talking about the tray. The, the, you know, the pennies for, for everybody. Oh, for everybody. Okay. Fight Club would be the movie that Peter Gibbons in his head, he thinks he's in. Started living for the Lord and I last. Now all I gotta say to you, one of you is gonna be crumb snatching coochie and pranksters. I love Kung Fu. Channel 39. Totally. You should come over and watch Kung Fu tonight. Okay. The character, I was thinking of these girls who, beautiful loser types. They hung out in the smoking area in high school and got a job. Everything to Joanna is just like, huh, okay, that's great. You know, she's a little bit of a stoner chick. Not very ambitious. I thought it was really smart of her not to play her as, you know, the, the, the blow drying glamour queen. Um, you know what, Stan? If you want me to wear 37 pieces of flair like your uh, pretty boy over there, Brian, why don't you just make the minimum 37 pieces of flair? But she's just basically, you know, a really sweet, pretty girl that, that works over there and is trying to work out her own, her own stuff. I do want to express myself, okay? And I don't need 37 pieces of flair to do it. It was probably tough for her because there's 
these expectations, you know, and I didn't, I didn't really think about it going in because I'd met her before and she was really pretty low key in person. I, and so when I put her in this, I hadn't really prepared myself for the, how much attention it would draw to just that, oh, what's she playing with? You know, every question being about her. Oh, I, I, I just don't know if this was such a good idea. Yeah, well, maybe it wasn't such a good idea for you to sleep with Lumberg. What? What are you? She's this because you know she's like oh she's the star and then you know she gets to she brings us up to her you know we we come with her but she didn't she didn't approach it like that she approached it like we were all very dignified hardcore players. Oh, I love being part of an ensemble. I love it. There's so much to play off of and especially this movie. The characters are so bizarre and distinct and fun. What do you think of a person who only does the bare minimum? Amazing, amazing timing, and it's. And it's the kind of timing, you know, Mary Tyler Moore too. It's the kind of timing where uh, it's not real show offy. You know what I mean? It's just like things fall. How dare you judge me? I mean, what are you? You think you're some kind of like angel here? No, you're just this penny stealing wannabe uh, criminal man. It was. It's hard to be in a scene with her and not be funny. She's really hot, but she also looks like a girl that you could believe would live in your neighborhood or went to your high school. She's got domestic hotness. I was a little starstruck, to be honest. I hid it for about two days. I kept it real cool for about two days of rehearsal, you know, and then I, then I caved, then I cracked. Give it to me. Come on, you little fucker. Let's go. That's what I need. Let's do that. Let's do exactly that, you little fuck. I love when he's playing angry, and he's also just good at, you know, he can be a good kind of weenie guy. And I must have put a decimal point in the wrong place or something. Shit, I always do that. I always mess up some mundane detail. There really isn't an office that doesn't have that guy, right? I mean, or several of those guys. I mean, especially, especially the worse the conditions are the more somebody's got to be like, I'm so much better in this place. I mean, he should have his own software company, at the very least. And he, I mean, he believes he's right at that moment, too. He always gives you something really realistic. He's, his instincts are so good, he's, he's not going to allow himself to do anything hacky. Here it is. To conceal the source of money as by channeling it through an intermediary. He's insanely brilliant, and his contradictions are inherent in the way he plays, you know what I mean? He's always playing this but that. Anyway, let's get down to business, Michael. You know, you, you can just call me Mike. All his backbone, all his convictions, just out the window. <laughs> out the window. He's just got to eat it all. I told those fudge packers I like Michael Bolton's music. Uh, I never thought of him as a nerd. I just, I really focused on his anger. PC load letter? What the fuck does that mean? Every time that the, um, Case of the Mondays woman would walk by, I'd be giving her the finger and stuff like that. And I, I think that <laughs> never that none of that made it in, but uh, uh, there was a lot of stuff on the fringes. Bolton doesn't give a shit anyway. You know what I mean? That kid's a full on gangster. I've got, got my, my pistol point cocked, ready to link shots non stop until I see your monkey ass drop. So, like, you know, if he, if he wears these these short shirts and these weird, nerdy kind of kind of ties and stuff like that, I, I don't think he's even really thinking about what he's wearing. You know, I think he's thinking about how he wants to, like, be down. Uh, yeah, well, I work at Inatech and I don't consider myself a pussy, okay? Yes, I am also not a pussy. Fact, they're gonna find it the hard way that I'm not a pussy if they don't start treating their software people better. I can't believe they have security escort us out. Not like we're going to steal something. Samir knows that he's been dogged out. He inherently has this thing against the company, too just like everyone there, looking for a chance, viciously looking for a chance to, 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 to screw it back to them. One of these days, I, I, I just kicked this piece of shit out the window. So I always thought Samir was a really cool, a really cool cat who wants to like really make good in America. You know, I'll tell you what I'd do if I had that money, you know, I call my friends. His real big contradiction in the movie is that like, you know, he's not gonna do the scam unless he gets to have sex. I have a question. Yes. In, in these conjugal visits, you can have sex with women? Yep. You sure can. 
Okay, I'll do it. Shit! This is a fuck! Son of a... I... I... That shit! Uh, Jay is a, a brilliant guy. He actually grew up in, I think, mostly Chicago. And he's like a hip-hop guy. He's part of a hip-hop group. He break dances. I've always been a break dancer and always been like a, a raver and a houser. And so he's like, can, can, you, can you please do something in, in the movie? And I was like, oh, I don't know if Samir would. Do. He's like, no, man, Samir would do it. You know what I mean? Not only that, that's who he is, really. Back up in your ass with the resurrection. Well, just a second there, Professor. We, uh, we fixed the glitch. He can be intimidating because he's always just, and that, that really worked for, for those scenes. When he says he loves Michael Bolton, you don't want to rain on his parade. I love his music. I do. I'm a Michael Bolton fan. I celebrate the guy's entire catalog. God, there's, there's probably endless footage of him talking about, you know, Bolton's softball videos and Bolton's this, and like he just goes, he, yeah, I celebrate the whole catalog. Have you had a chance to pick up the opera album yet? Oh. Stunning. Yeah. Very emotional. I dare you to listen to that song and not cry. And not cry. Not gonna happen. Can I let you all in on a crazy thing? I love Michael Bolton so much that a couple of years ago when the Had a Hit for Power of a Softball video came out, I snagged it. <laughs> I love the haircut. I love the way he's taken his career. I'm gonna say something right now, and I mean every syllable of it. I think he's one of the most significant performers on the planet. Outright. He's the man. It's out of sight. The thing that's funny is McGinley actually talks like that. He'll say, I celebrate. He came back a second time to read with the other guy, and he was just like, let's fucking shoot this thing. Come on, let's do it. Like, <laughs> give me the park. He's a, and he was on the plane flying down to Austin. He's like, I can hardly wait to get down there and just beat the shit out of those little punks. They're talking about the David Herman and <laughs> talking about doing the scene, and he's just, you know, he's one of those actors that just can't wait for the camera to roll. He just wants to go do it. There's an element of danger that, uh, that's why, you know, that's why Oliver Stone, I think, just utilized McGinley so much. What would you say you do here? He's got a living snake up his ass. He's got a living snake, he's just like charged. Yeah, that little thing, he kind of, we noticed that, you know, when we were editing, we were very careful to put that little thing he does in there. He's very, he's just got all this anger and he's trying to control it. The pleasure's all on this side of the table, trust me. Hey, Peter, man, check out Channel 9, check out this chick. Hey, man. Dietrich and I, as soon as we started talking about the character, he was, he always got it. Like we, in rehearsal, actually added some stuff, stuff he came up with. We didn't have a lot of time to rehearse. He came that day and we rehearsed for a few minutes, half hour maybe before we shot. But in that time, came up with a lot of good stuff, like the um, thing with he's got his own opener. That's all right, I've got it. I think the stuff about uh, take a look at my cousin, that was added. Well, you don't need a million dollars to do nothing, man. Take a look at my cousin. He's broke, don't do shit. The thing that he, I love that he does so perfectly is this thing that guys do when they come to your house to like a plumber or whatever. They do this kind of, uh, what I went ahead and did was, I went ahead and replaced the whole unit, okay? He does it a little bit when he says, uh, Yeah, I'm doing the drywall up there at the new McDonald's. He did that and he also got perfectly the two chicks at the same time. i tell you what I do, man. Two chicks at the same time, man. Eventually, yeah, we ended up thinking that the best way to go is that he, he's, he's really sincere. He's, he cares about him. <laughs> that's, that's, his, that's his dumb advice. Hey, Peter. Yeah. Watch out for your cornhole, bud. OK, Lawrence. It's kind of scary when I think, you know, a lot of these guys I found at the last second. You used to be addicted to crack? Yeah. <laughs> Make sure you wear a rubber, dude. Rub, rub, rubber, dude. We always like to avoid confrontation whenever possible. I'm very sorry. I do not know anything about any money laundering. <laughs> Did you get that memo, me memo? <laughs> All right, Peter. <laughs> Seems to be working now. <laughs> Kick someone's ass or become someone's bitch. Wow, that's messed up. Milton Wadhams. Who's he? 
you know, squirrely looking guy, mumbles a lot. I didn't see a whole movie in just the Milton character because I, he's one of those types of characters where you kind of don't want to know what happens when he's at home. And, you know, it's kind of funnier if you just get the tip of the iceberg. Could you turn that down just a little bit? But I, I was told that I could listen to the radio at a reasonable volume from 9 to 11. Yeah, no, no, I, I know you're allowed to. Uh... And I begged him to do one line that I came up with, with that I thought was the core of Milton's character, which was, uh, and the squirrels, they were married. I used to be over by the window and I could see the squirrels and they were married. <laughs> which described two squirrels fucking, but that's how he could explain life. I think Milton perceives himself as a perfectionist, and yet his outward appearance is slovenly. If you look on the tie, there's, there's stains all over the tie. Probably the guy has two shirts, and he wears them three days. Now, Milton, don't be greedy. Okay, but last time I didn't receive a piece, and I was told that Just I Just pass. Okay. He's an invisible nuisance that must be tolerated because he's a human on the planet. But he's like, it's like one of those guys who's... And then you go on to do something else because uh, the, he takes up space and, and he's, he's not a bad human being to them. I don't consider Milton over the top at all. I think it's one of my subtlest roles, actually. Even though it's a, a big character, it's, it's done really small. But, and I said, I, I don't care if they lay me off either, because I told, I told Bill that if they move my desk one more time, then, then, I, then I'm quitting. I'm going to quit. And, and I told Dom, too, because they've moved my desk four times already this year. The glasses literally were this thick. They were this thick. I couldn't see out of them without having contacts behind the thick glass. So I had contacts, the thick glasses, and the depth perception was there was none. So anytime I had to reach for anything, I had to practice it because I, I couldn't tell whether it was here or it was here. Or, uh, uh. No, that's really not my job, and I, I haven't received my so, piece. For now, why don't you go ahead and get yourself a flashlight and a can of pesticide. Excuse me. Excuse me. But, okay, but that's the last straw. Hello, Peter. Peter. What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Hi, Milton. Peter. What's happening? Hi, Milton. Milton. Yes. What's happening? You know, uh, is basically always on some kind of chemical that you know, won't allow him to go too quickly. Um, you're gonna have to talk to payroll about that. If you could just go ahead and make sure you do that from now on, that would be great. And uh, I'll go ahead and make sure you get another copy of that memo. He's either in control or maybe just slightly puzzled, you know, by the fact that somebody doesn't understand something. Now, are you going to go ahead and have those TPS reports for us this afternoon? No. Ah, uh, yeah. But just the fact that some that a hu human beings are trained in, in, in the work world to not have to listen to, you know, just don't, we don't, we're not listening. You listen to me and I just keep telling you what to do. It, it turns into Nazism. I don't really think he cares about what anybody thinks of him because he knows that they can't do anything to him or challenge his authority. And that's when, when Peter does, I think it just kind of stops Lumberg's brain. Look, I'm gonna have to ask you to go ahead and just come back another time. I got a meeting with the Bobs in a couple of minutes. Uh, I wasn't aware of a meeting with them. Yeah, they called me at home. <laughs> that sounds good, Peter. And uh, we'll go ahead and get this all fixed up for you. In the cartoon, I love the moment where the guy, where Milton asks him something, and the, the cartoon version of Lumber went, ooh, uh, ooh, that's gonna be kind of tight on the overtime. Mm. And so I, I said, Mike, can I, can I put the ooh in, in that scene? Ooh, yeah. Um, I'm gonna have to go ahead and sort of disagree with you there. The Tchotchke's manager, I ended up playing myself just because I had added that part late. We need to talk about your flair. 
I was in a Kinko's once, and I saw this guy, he, and he had those kind of glasses and a mustache, and a real prick, I could tell. He, the, this girl working there, a really young girl, had a Diet Coke over here, and he comes by, and he's just kind of like, I want you to move that Coke. And then uh, she's like, so, oh, why? And he goes, because I don't like it there. I like it over here. People can get a cheeseburger anywhere, OK? They come to tchotchkes for the atmosphere and the attitude. Atmosphere and the attitude. Mike has what you call fuck you money, right? So it's like when they say, no, listen, we want it, we want you. We really have to change that. He just he has the ability to say, fuck you, I'm not going to do that. I think Mike would have done it without, without the money, too. That's what makes Mike badass, and that he, sh he should continue to do that. He's sitting on so much good material right now that if he sprung on anyone, I mean, like what he's actually holding back right now, people, you know, mo most comedic directors would just be destroyed and, and like writhing on the ground. The dude has tons of back files of stuff that will keep you in stitches for like, you know, years on end. I've seen, I've seen what Mike collects, you know, his like private video file is like, oh, you can't, you can't bust him out. He's mad funny. The Lumberg thing was sort of my shtick for a while. I used to do that to the, our guitar player. He um, it injured his wrist or something, and so he was always asking me to carry his, help him carry his amp, and I would just always do this. Mm, yeah. Mm. I always love the, the passive aggressive. Yeah, that means no. Where you know, someone asks you for something, you go, mm, yeah. Mike tends to write the way that people spontaneously talk, and so it seems like they're spontaneously talking. I was actually writing, mm, yeah. <laughs> maybe another yeah here, and, a, and maybe a, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm just not sure about that right now. I know Dave Herman put in the ass clown phrase. Do you know how that got coined? I mean, because he couldn't say no talent he couldn't say Michael Bolton was a no... We can't call him a no-singing... No-talent... Asshole. Non-singing asshole. And the night before, I was out on a date with the woman who would be someday become my ex-wife, and she had used the word ass-clown out of nowhere. Because I was, you know, this was just had just recently happened, I was like, how about ass-clown? And, and we just kind of fit it in there, and I love it. Yeah, well, at least your name isn't Michael Bolton. You know, there's nothing wrong with that name. There was nothing wrong with it until I was about 12 years old, and that no-talent ass clown became famous and started winning Grammys. Hmm. Well, why don't you just uh, go by Mike instead of Michael? No way. Why should I change? He's the one who sucks. I kind of know exactly what that is, but what the hell is an ass clown? <laughs> I think there really is a release during that, that scene for everyone. That you know, it's just like everybody knows that inanimate object that has like become so real and so so much the the object of hatred. Mobsters have come up to me and said, you know, I love the way you did the printer. You know, it was, it was very authentic. We had a um, we had a, a guy there I remember who was like, you know, a tough stunt guy. You know, he's like, yeah, don't 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 touch your friends with your hands. Use the bat to move them out of the way. In fact, I remember there being a moment where they were looking to try to get a PG-13, and I was like, no way! You know, I was like, you know, I was like, no way! No way, I was like, I'm telling you right now, I'm gonna curse up a blue streak in this movie. The fuck does that mean? Piece of shit! My little fucker, let's go! The fuck is that? I'm an asshole, nobody hangs up on me! This is a fuck! You become someone's bitch. You guys can both eat my ass, okay? But then they switched from the swing line to the Boston stapler, but I kept my swing line stapler because it didn't bind up as much. I wanted it to be a, a bright enough color that it would stand out, that you would notice it. Swing line didn't make red staplers, so our department painted it. They had, had four for the film. They burned one up, um, one for my desk, a couple of, couple of backups. 
Um, I stole a backup, <laughs> so I've got one. I guess swing line, people kept calling an app swing line to try to order red staplers and they say we don't make them and they'd say what about the one in the movie and then people were selling these bootleg swing line red staplers on eBay and making a lot of money and so swing line started making one and now it's their top selling stapler oh there it is what it, here let me just go ahead and get that from you yeah. mm. great The way it played out was um, this very sort of, well, you know, very kung fu path of least resistance where we, I just kind of sort of just, you know, angled right around him. That was one of my favorite bits to do. And believe it or not, we, we probably shot that thing eight or nine times to get the walking past him with the, you know, that just looked like he wasn't even really there. So, Peter, what's happening? Listen. Uh, Who this movie is important to are people entering into that world, you know, about to walk the plank into those passive aggressive workspaces, or people who are already waist deep in it. You know, it saves people's ass at work. You know, I mean, I think that like a lot of people have to deal with exactly what office based people are dealing with. This isn't really a workplace comedy, it's kind of a, it's a comedy about authority. But I think office space touched like the soft underbelly of corporate America. There's really nothing like it. People are always trying to convince me. They're trying to convince me how important the movie is. They're generally going like, you don't understand. That's, it's, it's not just my office that speaks in office space speak. It's the entire office plaza or, or it's very different. It's, it's like, they feel like they found this movie and nobody else knows about it. And it's like, oh my God, this is, I mean, nothing feels better than that. That you're mirroring, that you're actually mirroring someone's life like that. Fucking A. Fucking A.